This is the Aftermarket Radio Network. Welcome, everyone, to yet another episode of Diagnosing the Aftermarket A to Z. I'm Matt Fonslow, and I feel like I have a very special treat for you guys today. We are graced by the presence of uh, Dr. Joshua Rosenblum, the department chair of the Department of Economics at the University of Iowa State or Iowa State University. Through emails, uh, I've sent a couple of questions and then really asked if you would come on and talk about economic theory with us. And before we get rolling too far here, I'm just going to quick thank our sponsor, Napa. The Napa Expo will be held July 18th through the 21st at the Venetian Convention and Expo Center in Las Vegas. Stay on the forefront of the latest technologies and industry trends. Registration opens April 2022, which is already open now. Not enrolled, but interested in attending? Contact your servicing Napa store for more information. So thank you very much, Dr. Rosenblum, for joining me. It's my pleasure to be here with you, Matt. Thank you very much. I guess the whole point of this really is I've noticed over the years that I think I can speak specifically for like independent auto repair shops and management that historically most shops are started by former technicians, uh, often disgruntled. They're good at fixing cars. They want to make more money or do things differently and feeling like they're going to do things better. So they buy a building or rent a building and start fixing cars out of it, start hiring people. And the next thing you know, they have a business, but they typically don't invest a lot of time or money in learning about what it is they're really doing as a business. I don't want to start throwing out terms right off the bat, but they don't know what kind of a competition they're in and they don't know what kind of a market they're in. Not not from like an economical or economic standpoint. And I'm just very fascinated by the subject that it can, you know, just the entire swath of things that economics covers in general, but specifically how it would help learning some of these concepts to better uh, position uh, the business to compete and hopefully make money for everyone under the um, umbrella or under the roof of that business. Economics is really about how people behave and about how individual decisions interact with each other to produce larger outcomes. And so one of the things that we think about are is this abstract concept of a market where people buy and sell things. And we there are some some markets that look like markets. The um the floor but until recently the floor of the New York Stock Exchange where people are buying and selling stock is is sort of the prototypical example of a of a market. But we can think about the the sort of more complicated business of people looking for a service provider like a automobile repair shop and the supply of of the services that those shops provide to customers and we can use those tools of economics to to think about and to understand how those individual decisions produce outcomes that may be different from what any one individual thinks they're doing and and to understand how different conditions in the society and the community can affect how those outcomes play out. Yeah, see, right off the bat, giving me stuff to think about. I guess the other thing that I would say just off the bat is that one of the the fundamental premises about, about economics and about economic transactions is that they're mutually beneficial. So that the characteristic of a market is that both the buyer and the seller are made better off by the transaction in which they engage. And so that really is the bedrock of pretty much everything that economists are thinking about is how to maximize that shared benefit, which wouldn't exist in the absence of that market. Yeah, I I think auto repair has a reputation, not a very good one. Pretty sure we're in the top three least trusted businesses or service providers uh, right up there with lawyers uh, and used car salesmen. Really, we are. Some of it is very, very much uh, earned. We kind of did it to ourselves. But I don't think a lot of it is on purpose. But in general, like you said, I think the vast, vast, vast majority of shops, technicians, that's what they're after. That mutual benefit. 
in exchange for X amount of dollars, I'm going to provide you with an accurate diagnosis and repair. So I suppose the first question that comes to mind is from an economic standpoint, it's better to start in the competition area. What kind of competition are we in? Like what is auto repair in the grand scheme of things? It's a service. Um, It's Something which uh, is a complicated service because, and part of the reason for the, the distrust or the the challenges of distrust are, is because a lot of what happens in that pro- in that service is very hard for the consumer to observe. They cannot validate independently what's been done. So you can take a part out of the car. You can say, here's, you know, look, I've relined your brakes. Here are the old, here are the old brake pads. You can see how worn out they are. But the consumer can't, you know, can't evaluate whether, whether the new brake pads have been put in correctly, whether they're the right kind uh, in most cases. And so they just don't know what the quality of that work is. Yeah, I kind of have like two examples that pop in my head ideas. One is like you're saying with the brake job that, Shop A, uh, you get an estimate that you go on with the complaint with your vehicle that every time you come up to a stop sign, there's this grinding sound and they will, you know, they look at it or they, you know, everyone kind of knows what's probably wrong. You know, it needs a brake relining or new brake pads, probably new rotors now. And so shop A gives you the quote of $300 and you think, oh, okay, um, I don't know if that's fair or not, but let me go get a second opinion, which I think is logical. Go to shop B and same thing, but their brake job is going to be $400. You could go to shop A and have it done. And when you're done, the first stop sign you pull up to, the noise is gone. They did it. They succeeded. Shop B, if you were to choose them, the same result. Most consumers have no way of knowing why shop B was $100 more. And there's many reasons that could be quality of parts. You know, shop A chose the economy lines of vehicle or um, of replacement parts where shop B chose the premium lines. Uh, There might be just operating, uh, I would say, operating uh, expense difference in that shop A may provide a 12 month, 12,000 mile warranty, whereas shop B is providing three year, 36,000 or more. So that's one hurdle uh, to overcome. And then the other one that comes to mind is more diagnostics heavy, where you bring your vehicle to shop A and it's not running very good. And they tell you it needs, you know, a tune up, which is really old terminology nowadays, but spark plugs. They put spark plugs in it, still misfiring. Okay. The spark plugs took out the ignition coils. So you need an ignition coil. Okay. Uh, You know. And down the line, and eventually you now have a lot of parts replaced, and maybe the vehicle runs fine. And shop B may charge more per hour to inspect, to come up with a diagnosis. So they spend their higher rate for analysis. However, they don't replace any parts. They find a broken wire, and it took an hour to find it or two hours to find it. And the parts replacement was like, you know, $2.00. You left paying far less, but initially there's a lot of um, rejection to shop B uh, because shop A may have came off with free diagnostics or very low cost diagnostics. And they threw all these parts at the car. And while they're replacing one of those parts, they fall in the broken wire, fixed the broken wire without you knowing and charged you for all that other stuff and told you. I don't think that happens a lot, but it, it does happen. Those are the hurdles we're up against. That's what I think you're talking about is there's the consumer has no way of being able to differentiate that. They have to trust the provider. That's right. It's very hard to verify. And in some cases, there are ways where you get expert reviews or you have other kinds of of feedback which can provide consumers with some guidance. But I think in the end, most people, they go someplace. They look in the yellow pages or they look online or they get a recommendation from someone and they go someplace and they get a feeling for whether they feel like they trust the person they're dealing with and they go back as long as they feel that that trust has been justified. That reputational component is a very important part of people 
do. And it, and and on the on the consumer side, gathering information is very costly. So consumers don't want to, you know, every time they need to have another repair done, they don't want to go gather information about where should they go for this. They want to, you know, as long as they're reasonably satisfied and that they tend to, to stay put unless they have a very bad experience or they have some other situation which leaves them disappointed. There's that initial period of shopping and then they tend to settle down. So I, I think there's not that it's all that important. I think there's a um, technical term for that then, right? For that competition we're in. Right. Markets like this are, this goods and services are referred to as credence goods. There's an element of trust. And so that's the case, uh, you know, for example, for a medical procedure, you go to the doctor and they tell you what they think is wrong and they tell you how they're going to, how they're going to address it. But you don't have any way to know. And in a lot of cases, you don't know after the fact, whether what they did was was the right thing or not. You don't have any way to assess whether another doctor and another treatment would have led to a different outcome. These are cases where it's very hard to, to verify, and those are a special class of goods called credence goods. I don't know if this falls under the economics portion, but the strategy is to try to overcome that. Like where I live, your choices of medical providers is limited severely. Like uh, Mayo Clinic is now a almost like a juggernaut of a medical provider. So your choices are very limited. Yeah, you can travel quite a ways to a different clinic or hospital, but it's still Mayo. Uh, it's hard to get out of that network. So I don't know that they, not that they don't have their own set of issues, absolutely. But when there's a repair shop every, in some cases, like every block, and I think we have a really nasty, nasty habit of running each other down in some foolhardy attempt to, to raise ourselves up. So I'm going to run shop B down so that I look better. And I, I, you know, I find that absolutely ridiculous. This is why, you know, I mean, so doctors go through a, a licensing process. And so, I mean, licensing and limits people's entry into markets. So, and different states have different rules about who needs a license to do what and what it takes to to have that license. But various kinds of things like that that it, that establish a baseline of trust. So, your technicians are certified by um, by Honda or General Motors that they have taken a certain amount of training and how to how to service these particular vehicles. Or you have some other kind of endorsement that that is, in some sense, per perceived as being reliable and not subject to purchase is one of the ways that that organizations can, you know, or, or individuals in a particular line of work can help to, to increase public trust in, in what they're doing and to, to demonstrate their, their qualifications. So that's, um, that's a tool. It can also be exploited by people who want to, in some sense, to, to limit limit their competition by setting up uh, licensing rules that really don't have very much to do with, with any of the services that are being provided. And so it can kick up both ways. You know, does the person who cuts your hair really need to have, you know, 60 hours of, of training on, on, uh, on, on hygiene to cut your hair? Would the world be better off with people who where it was easier to, to enter the haircutting business. If you're looking at daycare, you know, you want somebody to check that the conditions are hygienic, that the staff are trained, that they know what they're doing and understand child development, you know, different situations. And that's one, one of the ways that we, we deal with it. And another way to establish that trust, of course, is to, to offer a money back guarantee or satisfaction guarantee. And, you know, you see that with with new cars to some extent that manufacturers have, you know, offer this sort of relatively lengthy warranty now because they want people to believe that the quality of the vehicles is is high. And and in some sense that motivates them of course to to build vehicles that aren't going to require a lot of service in that time period. <laughs> Napa Auto Care was top rated in a national survey by consumers of car repair in the chains and independent repair shops category. Ratings were based on courtesy, timeliness, quality, price of repair, and percent of times the problem was fixed on the first visit. 
Napa Auto Care is the only banner program to make these ratings. Consumers are familiar with the Napa Auto Care brand, and you can benefit. Napa Auto Care has the largest network of independent professional shops in North America, with over 17,000 locations. Your independent repair facility can join this network and be supported through Napa's national marketing with the already successful Know How for All campaign, which promotes auto care center specific offerings. You get support to promote your local repair facility with targeted media in local markets and improving channels. Utilize a full calendar year of promotions with Napa Auto Care Sales Driver promotions that are 100% fully funded by Napa. This includes free email marketing, digital and print point of sale materials. Connect to their national presence by co-branding your locally known brand with the already nationally recognized Napa brand. Partner with Napa Smart Sign to educate customers with engaging videos that tell the why behind a needed repair or service. You can access and edit digital menu boards, template builder tools, social media feeds, and integrations with other auto care program elements. Offer a credit solution to customers with Napa Easy Pay Consumer Financing. Stay top of mind with your business's name embossed on the credit card. Have an online presence when consumers search for a local repair facility on Napa Online, which generates millions of views per month at no additional cost. If you are interested in partnering with Napa Auto Care and capitalizing on the Napa Know How for All national marketing campaign, contact your salesperson or servicing Napa Auto Care parts store. At least one of my ideas is the warranties, start increasing our warranties and not even looking for an outside entity to fund it, but that the shop itself self funds the warranty in that. Then it seems like it could be much less hassle rather than, you know, you brought your car to me. I did some repair and three weeks later, you're broke down, presumably similar or same issue or you know something I did. You call me up and I say, well, here's an 800 number, call them and they'll hand, take care of you. It's a big hassle. Uh, whereas you call me and I'm like, okay, where are you? I'm going to get this handled. And then what can I do to make this right? You know, I'm going to verify what happened. And if it's something we did or didn't do, you know, we got your back. In some cases, even if it wasn't our fault, you're a valued customer. We want your return business. We still got your back. Another idea is um, technology with the um, photos. It's so easy to take photos and upload photos, send photos, share photos to this is what we're doing. Short videos for their help justify what we're char- charging. And, you know, we try not to talk time with, with clients and that they want an estimate for, you know, we'll just keep picking on break jobs because it's easy. And usually they may call for a uh, one hour for the front, but customer may ask the labor is this much, the parts are this much. Okay. The labor is $150. Well, how long will it take? Oh, the book says a, an hour. You're $150 an hour? Well, that's usually a horrible idea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Say the better part of a morning or afternoon or something like that. They're looking at it and saying, well, you know, nobody makes $150 an hour, but of course you're not just paying the, you're not either I mean, paying yourself a salary or you're paying your technician a salary, but you're paying rent, you're paying insurance, you're paying for the, the time that it takes to do the estimates and to do the other business and the paperwork. And so all of that work that, that happens in that hour of changing the break has a set of kind of overhead costs that that have to be associated with it. That hundred and fifty dollars is you know is is not isn't just paying for the person's time. I've had customers ask me that, like, you make hundred and sixty dollars an hour? Yeah, I wish. I wish. Um a mere fraction of that, sir or ma'am. Maybe a little bit left field, but do you find that a lot of the public don't quite grasp that, you know, any department store they go to, they really think that that store bought that shirt for the same price they're selling it to you and that part of the money you're paying for this new shirt is yes paying for the clerk that's checking you out but also the lights and the rent and the ac you know the electricity i guess the gas and the for the winter to heat insurance so no i don't i think most people don't understand that i, I mean i i would like to say that they did because it would mean that 
when, if they took an introductory economics course, we actually communicated effectively with them. But uh, by and large, that doesn't happen. And a lot, a lot of students don't take that economics course. And the ones who do didn't always pay attention when we were explaining that, that part of things. So in high school, we need personal finance class. We need basic and an economics. I would be advocating for that, but uh, I'm self-interested. You know, I mean, we should probably be teaching people enough about how automobiles work so that they can have an intelligent conversation with, a, you know, with a technician. I, cars are so complicated today and so much of it is about, about a computer chip that, I mean, I remember in, in elementary school, we had a class where, where we actually did, you know, we took, had a, had one of the old VW bugs and we took the engine apart and put it back together. <laughs> You know, it was very revealing. I, could I do it? No. You know, it helped me to understand some of the complexity that someone who was doing it was dealing with. And so those are useful skills. I just find, you know, a lot of my interest in this is underlying theory. I study underlying physics to try to better understand how the system I'm uh, working on or trying to troubleshoot works. And I'm not saying like I know the mathematics behind you know, all thermodynamics, but thermodynamics, just that understanding that heat moves to cooler areas is a pretty important concept to grasp or, you know, electricity with um, voltage potentials and understanding that. And maybe I can't do these big equations, nor would I really need to. But the, these basic concepts, these underlying foundational concepts seem extremely important. That's one of the really big reasons I wanted you uh, on here to talk about that I feel like there is a lot of stuff going on that either we don't know about or maybe are doing successfully, but completely unwittingly. There is foundational theory underlying all of it. And in many times it might be able to explain phenomena we notice or help us make choices uh, down the road for our businesses that it kind of boggles my mind that uh, a lot of these words we're talking about and we'll talk about more in our common conversation or vernacular when talking about our, our businesses, our markets. Not to keep on it, but I again, thank you so much for coming on. <laughs> my pleasure. And I think it is the power of, of a theory like that is that it, or of any theory that has utility, is that it allows you to see underlying mechanisms that are maybe not immediately obvious. So it's a little bit like looking at an x-ray and seeing the structure underneath something and seeing how it is, how the pieces connect. And a, a good theory simplifies that. It is at a level of, of simplification that abstracts from things that you don't need to know for to apply it and yet it is complex enough to capture the things that are important yeah i will probably be doing an episode on the simpsons paradox uh, and statistics because i feel like there's instances that ex uh, rewarding employees positive versus uh, negative reinforcement and also like advertising that with too many weight they don't do a whole lot of advertising because the bays are full. Don't advertise because we can't take on any more anyways. And they wait for the lull. And then they call up the newspaper, the radio station. They get Facebook. They do the Facebook ads and they're throwing money at it. Maybe not boom, but within a time period, the bays start filling up again. And the idea is the advertising worked. And I'm thinking Simpsons Paradox maybe suggests that, you know, if the mean was the bays are were busy. Now it starts dropping and maybe it falls, maybe not quite outlier, but it drops out of statistical control, if you will. But if we had just sat back and waited, it was going to go back up anyways, because it kind of had to. Unless there's something very broken, like you're really doing poor work and stuff like that. And eventually all the advertising in the world won't help you. That's actually one of the things that economists are, are very concerned with is the distinction between correlation and causation. So correlation, I advertised and the base filled up, but did the advertising cause the base to fill up? And we face a fundamental problem because you can't run the world both ways. You can't do this experiment again, go back and say, all right, let's see if, if we ran this tape again and we didn't buy the advertising, would the world turn out differently? They kind of spend a lot of time thinking about clever ways to get around that in, in the work that they do to be able to say, did this policy or that action have a de the desired effect? Um, was this really responsible for 
for the outcome that we saw. That's a very powerful principle in, in life that we need to be attentive to and not leap. Humans are um, we're pattern seekers. We try to see patterns in, in everything around us. And sometimes we see patterns that don't exist. <laughs> it does take a certain amount of trained discipline to resist that, to be attentive to the ways in which you can be misled by, by, by the patterns you think you see. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> and not just like patterns like you're talking about, but even <laughs> one of the pieces of test equipment we use is an oscilloscope. If you're familiar with an oscilloscope, not to insult your intelligence, but one oscilloscope you're probably familiar with, at least, not saying it's ever been hooked up to you, is an EKG, and it graphs the voltages to your heart. Well, we hook up uh, a similar piece of equipment to electrical circuits on a car and watch the waveforms and their signatures. And like you said, humans are very good at recognizing patterns, recognizing symbols, but associating those patterns with something and seeing something there that's not really there. Even yet another angle to what you're saying. No, that makes sense. Then I think that kind of leads us to one of my emails to you, and I could be completely full of it too. I could be, I could have a lot of these uh, terms in my head and term definitions, but really, and most likely no idea what I'm talking about. But what would you consider the the market that uh, auto repair shops are operating in? I mean, I think in some sense you are, you know, you're operating in the larger market for transportation services in some sense. I mean, so if I own a car, I've made a decision to to take on that piece of owning a, owning a piece of capital equipment and keeping it operating. And if I were sufficiently talented and I had the time and the tools and the attention, then I might maintain it myself. But absent that, uh, you know, in some sense, you're a piece of the service industry and keeping vehicles going is... Uh, is really what you're doing, and uh, people have other choices about transportation. They could, uh, they can rent a car. They can say, "I'm not going to own a car. I'm going to just use Uber or Lyft, or uh, maybe I'm just going to own a bicycle. I'm going to take public transit." You're in that piece of of the transportation business. I think is is one way to think about this. But in another sense, you are really just, you know, I mean, you are you're a service provider. You're um, you're helping people to maintain their lives in the same way that, that many other people help to do other specialized tasks. So uh, repair my plumbing, uh, fix my air conditioner, make sure that the heat turns on in the winter. Those are all very similar pieces of service. And so you're not just you're just selling the repair. You're not just selling a, a new part. You're you're trying to make that transaction as easy as possible for people. I mean, that's what makes it, you know, we've talked about trust, you know, they need to trust you, but the other piece is about making it easy to do that business and thinking about how that works. So would it be better to, to sell, a, you know, a service plan? We're going to be, you're going to pay a fixed fee to, you know, for us to take care of some set of common services and you can bring the car in and we'll take care of the things that need to be taken care of. That would be a you know, sort of white glove kind of service where you can, uh, you know, so, so I think there are lots of ways to think about. And I guess if you think about that piece of the world that way, then maybe it suggests some ways to be innovative about the business that you're in and the services that you provide. You know, and so the, the waiting room is the waiting room, at, you know, a, a nice place. Do people want to come sit there while service their car? Are you selling half hour oil changes? Uh, you know, the convenience of dropping in as opposed to um, having to schedule in advance and leave the car and get a ride somewhere else. I mean, all those are sort of part of the package. And you can either, you know, kind of incorporate them where you can say they're not my business. They're going to be somebody else's business. It probably sounds like the same question, but I don't think so. Are we easily categorized into a specific competitive market? And it probably sounds like I'm leading you and I that's not what I'm trying to do. Economists think about markets as being competitive, in which case the people who are providing whatever the, the good or service is are do a small piece of the business relative to the total market and their identities really don't matter. You're not in that market. You're in what what economists would describe as a as imperfect competition. One way to put that is that in a perfectly competitive market, you have no control over the price that you charge. It is the price that everybody is charging, and what they're providing is 
identical and one to the other, but you're not. You're in a market where if you were to say that, that the cost of your labor services was $160 rather than $150 an hour, there are some people who would say, oh, that's too expensive, and they'd go down the block and look for somebody else. But there are other people who would say, I like this business. I've been doing business with them. It's not worth it to me to, to go somewhere else. And so they would pay the higher price. How imperfectly competitive the market is, is really a question of how how much pricing power you have, how much you would drive people away if you deviated from the price that others are charging in that market. And so that's the sense in which it's an imperfectly competitive market. And you're differentiated not only in the, the service you provide, but your location. Are you convenient? Um, so I might choose to go to somebody who's on my side of town rather than on the other side of town because it saves me 15 minutes of driving or some other inconvenience that the hours are different or any of a host of different characteristics. So um, you have some people who, for whom it's easier to do business with you and others for whom it's, it's harder. And so you're, if you're in a big, big community, there are lots of other people who are do, providing the service. But if you're in a small town, uh, then there might be only one or two other choices. And so you have different levels of discretion about how competitive you are in, in those settings. That was really good. The imperfect competition. And I think I was trying to avoid dropping terms, I don't want to sound stuffy with them. I know they're technically true, but I am not the expert by any means. I, I don't know if I even I don't know if I even have a real elementary grasp of them. But I think in one of my emails I had made a suggestion and I could be full of it in this idea. I feel like a lot of independent service facilities act as if they're in a uh, monopolistic competition when in actuality some of it would be maybe by their choice, but they could start acting more as if they're in an oligopoly. I will leave the definitions to the expert here because I might be way misusing them. Right. So economists think about these different market types as lying maybe on a, on a spectrum. So at one end, um, monopoly is the case where there really is only one person who is providing the good or service. And in that case, they supply the entire market and they can choose, in a sense, how much of that market to supply by choosing the price at which they, they sell. And the price and the, and the amount that they sell are, are going to be related. The higher the price, the, the less they sell. And they, they make a choice based on that and on their, um, their profitability at different points. And I mean, and if you take, take an economics class, you at some point go through this analysis and you figure out through a variety of different mathematical tools what the place for a monopolist to be is. At the other extreme is this model of perfect competition in which no matter how much I sell within the capacity to sell, I have no impact on the price because I'm small. So if I'm a Iowa farmer who uh, farms 200 acres of, of corn or soybeans, I don't have a, whether I sell my corn or soybeans or I don't has no impact on the a total market. It's not going to affect the price at all. And so I am, I don't have any bargaining power. I just have to take the, the price that is being offered to me. And so that's, that's an example of, of being in a, in a perfectly competitive market, at least from the perspective of, of that small farmer. And then there is a, essentially an infinity of, of points between those two extremes where people have different levels of, of, uh, control. That is, that's really the function of how much how much pricing control do you have? The more, the more you can choose to raise your price and the less impact it has on, on the number of people who consume what you're selling, the more you're at the monopolistic end of the spectrum. And so monopolistic competition is, you know, to the extent that, that you are differentiated, that maybe you, you know, there are only three or four independent shops that work on 
a particular model of car or a particular brand make, then yes, there are, you know, the number of choices that consumers have in a particular area is, is limited. And if they're in Rochester, they're not in Minnesota, they're not going to go, not going to go up to St. Paul to get their car serviced unless you have a particular need that, that really causes you to, to do that. In the same way, if you have a, a, a medical condition, you're most likely to go to the, the local provider. But if you have a rare condition, you might decide that you want to go to uh, the specialist who might happen to be near you or they might be halfway across the country. Uh, you bring up a couple of really good points that one way to try to get out of that ceiling whether it really exists or not. Because I think some of the ceiling may be set by fear. I don't know that a lot of um, managers uh, or owners raise their prices to just see when they start getting negative responses from it. But a lot of it too, to just kind of defeat that or uh, bypass it is specialization, really focusing on few services or like you mentioned car lines or uh, makes of vehicles or providing services no one else does right like you suggested you might have to travel quite a ways to get the service provided or whatnot that now you're better able to set your prices and then maybe better able to you know increase your profits so that you can uh, hire specialists to do the job better and faster right thus hopefully raising profits and keep saying profits there in economics is there such thing or do you do you guys ever discuss like ethical profit is that even is that a thing one of the things that's hardest to teach students in introductory economics is that um in a perfectly competitive market there are no profits profits are zero but that doesn't mean that people aren't making money they're getting paid for their time and their talent. And so if you own a business, you are getting a return on the investment, the the, the financial capital that you've sunk, um, as well as the time that you spend managing that business. In a situation where you do have pricing power, where you have some degree of, of monopoly, so the competition is imperfect, then you do earn a profit because of the inability of of competitors to to take that market away from you easily so you have you have some advantage which you have have created and economists will you know typically see that as a reward for the investment you you've made in one one form or another of providing this service and so it may be that you have differentiated yourself in ways that serve customers. And so uh, economists would say, if you're, if you're making a profit, for, I mean, if, you, if you're simply, you know, you have this business and you're just basically printing money because you have this wonderful situation, then it ought to tempt somebody else to, to say, hey, wait a minute, he's making $160 an hour doing, the, doing this simple thing. Why don't I get into that business too? Then you'd have this competition, and you wouldn't be able to make that that money anymore. But economists don't generally talk about ethics in in this context. I mean, they do get drawn into conversations about how how things are distributed and whether that's that's fair. And so we see that there are many situations where there are very strong economists call economies of scale. So think about social media. So to Facebook, when Facebook was getting started, there were other services like MySpace and other other entities. But the value of being on social media is the value of everybody else who's on that same social media platform. So in some sense, the world only wants one. Or you know, or at least you know, within within the United States, only one, and maybe in China, it's something different. But the point is that in in that circumstance, you can uh, you make an, a tremendous amount of money because you're the the dominant firm, the dominant provider, and the economics make it very hard for anybody else to enter. And and economists would say that that's a situation in which. Um, 
they might not say ethical or unethical, but they would say that the benefits of this same service could be provided in a way that distributed the the financial gains very differently. Those are situations in which economists would say there are alternative ways of doing this and for different criteria about how we want to organize society and how we want people to benefit, there might be different ways to to do this. She's giving me a lot to think about. You know that? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. I hope, I like I hope it. what I didn't do was, was, was confuse you. <laughs> no, it's just, um, I, I like thinking about things differently and con- different considerations and the perspectives of others, not just, you know, consumers of the product or the service, but also you know, like yourself, where you're looking at this at a much different way, arguably like the way I might look at a vehicle uh, versus a, a client. You, you're looking at uh, all the intricacies and mechanisms that make this thing work. You know, what makes this vehicle roll down the road? And you're looking at the the business and the markets and how these work together to uh, you know, hopefully, hopefully, mutually benefit. Right. I don't. I could listen to it and talk about it all day. It, it just it's very in, intriguing to me. It's probably really jumping the gun. It, it probably really is. But there is um, more theory. I don't know how new it is, really, in the grand scheme of things, um, with economics. But it's stuff I like to think about and toy with. And uh, maybe dancing around here a little bit with it, but it's 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 game theory. Mm-hmm. And the vast majority of listeners, I think, their association with it or what they would recognize as game theory is probably probably from the movie A Beautiful Mind, right. probably, and the Nash Equilibrium, and not saying how accurate the movie is or anything like that, but it does seem like there's some principles involved that don't require deep math, uh, just the concepts of it, that I think are applicable to us even now. And I I suppose it's the prisoner's dilemma, right? I mean, that's kind of the, that is the uh, problem that uh, I think game theory kind of gained some fame with. And then later Nash, the Nash equilibrium getting added kind of to that, not maybe not specifically prisoner's dilemma, but, at least some economics, uh, economic value. Am I jumping the gun with this stuff? Am I uh, no, no, really no, leapfrogging? No. Or no, a, a game, game theory is a, is very powerful, and it is. I, I guess the, the best way to describe it is that it's a way of thinking about human interactions where people behave strategically, so they understand that other people are paying attention to their choices and are going to make choices based on what they think that the other participants are going to do. And so each person is analyzing that. And so the Nash equilibrium that you mentioned is a way of characterizing outcomes in those situations of strategic behavior that we believe are likely to, are likely to be the outcome. So in the case of a prisoner's dilemma, it describes the the way in which uh, in the absence of of coordination so i i i have two choices and the other person with whom i'm interacting has two choices and my choice has a consequence for what i get out of the situation as well as what the other person does and the nash equilibrium describes what is the best choice for me uh given that the other person is going to make the choice that's best for him, him or her. Yep. And so game theory is a, is a very rich subject for analyzing situations that, that are characterized that by those kinds of choices. So if you're an airline and there are, and you provide service between uh, St. Paul and Des Moines, and there's one other airline that also provides that service, then you are making a choice about, uh, you know, we come back to the pricing choice. So how much am I going to sell airline seats for? And if I raise my price, what I have to think about is, is, 
will the other airline say, yeah, we'll, we'll raise our price too um, because it's an opportunity for both of us to profit? Yep. Or are they going to say, no, we'll keep our price down and we'll take more of your business? But in making that decision, I'm thinking about well, what is my choice, but I'm also thinking about what is what is the other airline's choice in this circumstance and how are they likely to behave? And game theory provides a way to get out of the sort of running around in circles, chasing different answers to say, how you know, what do we think is likely to happen in this circumstance? And so uh, it, it's a set of tools that, that do that. And it is because so much of the world is characterized by these kinds of interactions where the other the other parties are known to you and where you have this th- this opportunity to behave strategically relative to each other uh, it's very powerful it's very useful very practical in a lot of circumstances and it has also led to uh, a field of of economics called mechanism design where de- designing a a process of interaction uh, with a particular goal in mind is helpful. So um, one example, one practical example of, of mechanism design is the area of kidney transplants. So you need to have, there needs to be a match between a donor and a, a recipient. Uh, people can be donors voluntarily because we start out life with two kidneys yep. and we only need one. And so in many cases, someone might have a close relative who requires a kidney transplant, and they may or may not be a good match for that person. But what the mechanism designers have done is come up with a, me- a way in which they can establish chains of donation. So I might not be a good donor for um, someone in my community, but I might be a, a good donor for somebody uh, somewhere else who I don't know. And they may have somebody who wants to donate a kidney for them, but they, they're not a good match. And we can put together a whole chain of these donations in which everybody's uh, needs are met by donating to an, you know, to people who you don't know, but who somehow we connect this all up. And so that they've come up with mechanisms to, to facilitate this kind of exchange between people. It comes from applying some of the principles of game theory to solving these problems. One of the ways in which it's been used. Uh, Another is in developing the right kind of bidding procedure for auctioning off radio spectrum to uh, cell phone uh, providers. So um, this is an area where the, the federal government made billions of dollars more from their spectrum auction because they followed the advice of the economists about how to how to structure this this market so that uh, people would would really pay pay the right amount they would reveal how much they valued the the spectrum and so that the federal government was able to capture more of of that benefit and reduce its need for other uh, other taxes instead of letting let it, letting Verizon or AT and T profit from 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 getting this at a bargain. Is there a hard line between competitive and cooperative game theories? Because it seems like they could really almost mishmash, like the scenario you were talking about with the pricing. That could be cooperative, seemingly cooperative as well as competitive. Right. So 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 there's a there's a strong incentive for the airlines to get together and, and agree we're going to raise prices. That's why the federal government has has rules about competition that say you can't do that. And then there are lots of ways to circumvent that. So I might post prices that are going to go into effect next week. I don't have to say, hey, let's get together and agree. I post those prices and I see if you post your prices. And then if you don't, then I drop my price back down. And I say, well, oops, I, I changed my mind. You know, so there's a whole lot of that. Sometimes uh, collusion of that kind is, is certainly a game theoretic concept and uh, cooperation. If you can find a mechanism to cooperate then you can often make yourself better off. You know, even off the cuff, is there advice that you would give independent service provider and independent repair shop about their businesses or about marketing strategy ideas? And I have to preface this by saying that uh, I don't have any particular expertise in this, so I don't really want to encourage anybody to to do what I'm suggesting, you know, without 
due caution. So, but I do think that understand that that you are selling a you're providing a differentiated product. You're not identical to the person down the street, and that you're likely to be rewarded for things that make people feel more comfortable and more loyal to you. And so viewing what you do, not just as repairing cars, but as having a relationship with your customers and and communicating effectively with them and providing them with the, the most convenient way, you know, or thinking about what features of the service make it more or less convenient to them. So it isn't just about who who repairs the cars fastest or best or uses the highest quality parts. It's about communicating that, about providing demonstrations of it. So you know, we talked at the beginning about about this piece about being credible, about establishing the, the credibility of, of the advice you're providing, establishing that you are qualified to do the work and that you have had these skills and that your work will be of high quality. And so you want to communicate that in ways that some of them are practical and direct and some of them are really about the psychology of the way that people respond to things. Does the shop look neat? Um, you know, I think if I go into a dealer's shop or an independent shop and there's oil on the floor and there are spare parts around, it makes me wonder about what they're doing in a way that then a place that this tidy makes me feel more comfortable. Like they really care about doing a good job and taking care of how they treat their own property and equipment as well as how they treat my car. You know, looking at, at that full range of things and not just at uh, at the expertise of, of repairing the automobile is probably important. And uh, I think, you know, go back and listen to, to a lot of what we talked about. I think a lot of what we discussed is is relevant to this. In running with what you're saying there a little bit, we don't outright say it, and maybe we should, but for our shop, name is Riverside. We try very hard not to run down anybody, try very hard not to do that. But our service here, and we'll go back to brakes because it's it's easy to do, the, the brake job that everyone's kind of familiar with, and then there's a Riverside automotive brake job. And we also do this, this, and this, and try to include photos or videos to kind of illustrate that on top of what you would expect to get or maybe know to get, easily find to get on a Google search or a YouTube, that we also do this, that hopefully builds value, not just so we can charge more, but also over time, it demonstrates that value over and over by longevity. You know, nothing would be worse than to do some sort of a service, have you have an issue take it to another repair shop due to proximity and have somebody coming out and bringing you back to your car to show you the work we did. And even if it wasn't quote unquote shoddy, just not what it should have been at least didn't go that extra step. You know, if they can be in the back going like, well, whoever did this knew what they were doing or they did a really nice job. Unfortunately, this part failed on them or something like that. You know, and I think that that this essence about consumer loyalty, that if you treat people right, they will, they're not going to, leave just to save a few dollars, but it takes an investment. I mean, you have to establish that, you know, and so that's probably part of the cost of starting a business is that you spend more time with people explaining what you're doing and you maybe offer them lower prices than what it really costs to do things at first to to help them to see why this, why they should try you. That's why sometimes people offer, you know, a new customer discount or uh, something like that as a way of encouraging people to take that step and to try. And then that gives you the opportunity to demonstrate the things that, that differentiate you. I think that's called a loss leader. Yeah, it can be a loss leader. Yep. In the grocery store market world, a loss leader is, you know, is something that you advertise to bring people in and then you, you then you sell them the more expensive stuff. But, <laughs> you know, but I think it, in your case, you know, if you see everything as a one-off transaction, then you have to recover on that particular transaction all of your costs. But if you see business really is about relationships, relationships with customers who are going to trust you with the, the simple and the complex want to invest in in developing those relationships because uh, that's how you build up the customer base that allows you to to stay in business rather than to have people who just drop in once and get one thing done and then they don't come back. Yeah, I mean, you're causing my brain to just light up with stuff. 
because we do have lost leaders with like oil changes. Shops will greatly take losses on those to get the vehicle in for the opportunity to look your vehicle over and then sell you the stuff that they need to make the money to keep the doors open. And that's sometimes a really difficult thing to breach with a client that they've been kind of trained almost exclusively oil changes, maybe alignment, wheel alignments too, that it should not cost more than $50. You're telling me that your oil change costs $150? You must be insane. Well, guess what? I've priced myself so that I can make money on your oil change so I don't have to find anything wrong with your vehicle to make money. The shop down the street, I don't know how you do it without trashing them a little bit, but it's like, understand what's going on here. They can't make money doing what they're doing. They have to find something wrong with your vehicle. Understand they have to, because if they don't, the doors don't stay open. That's an education piece. And it's a, but you have to get people's attention to be able to educate them. Well, you've had my attention, sir, the whole time. Well, thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure to talk with you, Matt. Yeah, thank you. And if there is any way I could have you on again, that would be phenomenal. I think whenever you talk, so many things pop into my head, so many questions, so many ideas. And I sound like a broken record, but I so appreciate you being on. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. And thank you. All right. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And uh, like I said before, if you have uh, any ideas, any questions, don't hesitate to email me at mattfonzlopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to Napa again, and thank you to the Aftermarket Radio Network. Until next time, thanks for listening. You've been listening to Matt Fonzlo diagnosing the aftermarket A to Z on the Aftermarket Radio Network. Follow Matt on your favorite listening app. He's very interested in what you have to say. Let him know what you'd like him to cover and come on the show. Matt is all for advancing the aftermarket. Find Matt Fonslow on social media and connect or on aftermarketradionetwork.com.